This week on the Cynical Optimists. Spider-Man meets Mysterio. Final Fantasy VII Remake gets a mysterious new trailer. And a Pokemon-based mystery in Detective Pikachu. Hello and welcome to the Cynical Optimists, where we're on the case whether you like it or not. I am Phil. And I am Nick. And this week, talking about being on the case and detective work and investigating, we are going to be looking at Detective Pikachu. Well, I say looking at, we've already seen it, we're going to be talking about Detective (laughs) Pikachu. We looked at it already, now we're going to talk about it. Yeah, it's it's this new thing we're trying. (laughs) Um, A very boring episode, it's just us watching the film. I well, yeah, it'd, it'd require a tighter edit than we usually have the patience for. <laughs> we usually are just like, shall we take that out? Nah, nah let's leave it in. <laughs> um, but before we get on to that, it's going to be the news of the week, starting with film and TV. And to kick off film news, uh, Phil, did you watch the first It movie? No, I didn't. I heard it was decent, though. Yeah, it's Wait, pretty good. are we talking about... The first It movie, or the first of the remake It movie? Alright, pedantic. The first of the remake (laughs) It movie. (laughs) Uh, No, on both accounts. I don't know why I just. Do you mean the Stephen King novel? (laughs) I can't watch a book. I mean the movie that's relevant and the one people have actually watched. Have you watched it? (laughs) No. (laughs) Okay. Um, I think it's on Now TV. It's well worth a watch. I was spooked. It's a bit more than the sort of generic horror movie that you get. Um, it's quite old school. It's a bit Stranger Things kind of vibe. It's fun. Okay, um, yeah. Well, we've had the trailer for It Chapter 2, which looks super spooky. Um, yeah, I, I think it looks really good. It's um, The cast this time includes Jessica Chastain and James McAvoy um, as older versions of the characters from the first one. Um, Pennywise is back. He's the clown. Yeah, no, I, I, the thing is, I, I heard about the first one, I heard it got good reviews, yeah. to be honest, I heard the original book is kind of two parts anyway, in yeah. a sense. It doesn't seem like a cash grab, which is quite nice. Yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, um, and yeah, there's a spooky bit at the beginning of the trailer with um, an old woman who's who seems like a, a manifesta- another manifestation of it, other than Pennywise the Clown. I just, yeah, it's really fun because... It can um, manifest itself in any kind of character, but predominantly mm. it's obviously Pennywise. But um, yeah, it looks really good. I'm super excited for that. And make sure you catch the first one, Phil. It's worth a watch. I'll take that under consideration. I'll add it to the long list of stuff you've recommended me. <laughs> I st- still need to get through watching all the uh, the films that I hadn't seen from last week. You haven't watched Psycho yet, then? No, no, I haven't watched Paul Iko's Titchener Adventure yet. <laughs> uh, that makes no sense if you didn't listen last week. <laughs> it's a good episode, though. You should go back and listen to it. A sequel that I think you, well, that I know you have watched is um, Spider Man Far From Home. We've had the trailer for that. Yes. I think this was released, this was released like on the day of the last episode. So for some reason, I, I thought we'd watch this, but. We haven't we haven't talked about this yet. Um, you seen it? No, it it was one of those cases where I think as soon as I got back to back home after we recorded because we did it in person, hmm. um, I saw it pop off on my feed and I was like, oh for God's sake! There's yeah. always something, isn't there? <laughs> I thought um, the trailer was really good. Yeah, me I'm too. Interested? Lots of spoilers. Well, not spoilers for the film, but spoilers for what's Endgame. happened post Endgame. Exactly. Um, yeah, we get to see lots of Spidey suits. Four, yes, I think he... I counted. Yeah, because there's his homecoming one. Yeah. There's the black, completely black one, like the noir S- one. Stealth, stealth suit, yeah. There's the red and black one, I think I noticed. Yeah. And there's the iron spider. There's the iron spider at the beginning as well. Yeah, looks. Uh, I like seeing different spidey suits, so that's fun. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we get a lot of references to the ending of Avengers Endgame. Uh, spoiler alert. Tony Stark is dead. Um, 
so we see Peter like trying to sort of be the new Iron Man in the world I guess hmm I thought one interesting bit was where Nick Fury recruits Spider-Man and he says that he's pretty much one of the only superheroes left hanging around on Earth yeah. Thor is off world Captain Marvel is unavailable um but yeah, it's trying, uh, trying to think who's not reti- who doesn't retire. Uh, I suppose you could get like Rhodey. Yeah, yeah, War Machine's still <laughs> kicking about. Ant Man's still kicking about. Yeah. It doesn't seem like they would naturally go straight to Peter Parker, but I, I guess don't know. He's, I think... he's pretty strong, I suppose, isn't he? Yeah, and the whole like Nick Fury's kind of part in all of this. Obviously, he originally went to Tony Stark. Hmm. So possibly he sees, he's trying to see what Tony saw in Peter. Yeah, through this. I guess um, is Professor Hulk. Professor Hulk is his arm still buggered from the snap? I'm not sure. True. Um, yeah, that's a weird one, isn't it? That's just a thing now. Yeah. Professor Hulk. <laughs> yeah. But also, this is it's it's ahead of a time jump in the future as well. We're five years ahead of like. Actually, about six years ahead of the previous Spider-Man movie. Yeah, so I'm not sure. This is the thing. Like the five-year time gap does make a lot of sense in the context of Endgame, mm. but it kind of is a bit of a elephant in the room for all the films after follow it now. Yeah, don't they do this in Parks and Rec as well, where they suddenly make a bit of a time jump and everyone's using slightly better tech and stuff? Yeah, although. Not like half of the Parks and Rec cast weren't like dead. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> Do you think in the background of scenes you'll start seeing like a bit of extra technology and stuff like that? Well, the thing is, I think it's heavily implied that tech didn't really move that far forward in the yeah. five years because well, I guess of half the... the people, yeah, yeah, it's a bit dystopian. Yeah. So what I'd expect possibly more is maybe like things being rebuilt, like structures being put back in place in the background. I suppose like it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the top priority, would it? Like, let's make sure we bring holograms out and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we'll see how that affects affects the world in that film that's coming out in July. Looks pretty good. I'm excited to go see that actually. Me too. And you can tell that Sony were just like bursting at the seams to release another trailer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because they've even got Tom Holland at the beginning warning people that's got spoilers. Well, apparently it's being um, added to the end of Endgame as like I heard that. Player, yeah. as like the post instead of a post credit scene because that film doesn't have one. Yeah, which I think makes sense because they can't play it before the movie. Yeah, That's and they can't idea. risk playing it in front of other movies at the moment. Yeah, but no, that looks that looks pretty good. Um, mm. That's about it for movies, but moving on to TV, uh, Netflix and Dark Horse Entertainment have struck a deal, which means Netflix will basically get, like, dibs on any Dark Horse Comics properties. Okay. Um, That's quite interesting, because they've also got the rights to uh, George Miller's Miller World as well, uh, Mark Miller's Miller World um, comics and stuff as well. Hmm. So um, I'm quite excited to see what sort of left field comic book properties we're going to get from Netflix over the next few years yeah it seems like obviously Marvel are taking their shows to Disney Plus mm. so Netflix are saying well we you know we're going to do our own thing now we're going to find different comics to make into TV shows yeah but yeah it could be very interesting um, did you see because um, the Umbrella Academy was a dark horse property did you watch that on Netflix no, I keep on getting recommended it though. This is a rolling trend, as you can see. Yeah, I I don't think I would recommend it particularly. It's it's not bad. Um, there's some very frustrating plot elements in it though. Hmm. Um, no, it it looks kind of I don't know. It gave me too many uh, early DCEU vibes of being like dark and gritty and grr. <laughs> it's kind of and more was... like it's more like DC TV, if anything. I think it's a bit over the top violence and. Some on a budget <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah basically <laughs> some of it's very silly as well um, there's a lot of plot elements that aren't I don't know I guess it's quite bold to have a lot of like stuff going on a show which you don't necessarily have to explain but also they never explain why there's a talking chimp that just happens okay it's a bit weird 
but give it a go. Fair. It's, it's <laughs> some bits are worth it. Um, what else have we got? Watchmen TV series. Have you seen the trailer for this one? I didn't see the trailer. I saw it announced, but yeah. I haven't sat down and watched the trailer because I haven't seen the original Watchmen. So I was like, does it connect to the film? Um, I don't think. Or is well, it like different? The film. The film is pretty much the comic books, like plot by plot. Um, uh, okay. And this is kind of set in the future of that, I think. So you can see like how um, Rorschach has like had an effect on the population and stuff. From presumably they've all read um, Rorschach's diary. It I, look, I I read a few issues of. Um, the Doomsday Clock, which is which is the comic book sequel to Watchmen, um, mm-hmm. this looks like it takes a few sort of elements from that. There's like the ticking noise throughout the trailer and stuff. Um, but yeah, I didn't really get very far with that series. But <laughs> we'll see how this one pans out. Um, it's HBO, so it's um, it's one of the writers of Game of Thrones actually, and and the, the same studio as Game of Thrones. So expect big budget. Expect it to be pretty visually arresting. I think it'll be, I think it'll be quite good. I was going to say, if Game of Thrones ending, HBO are probably looking for something to take that place. Yeah, other than the the Game of Thrones prequel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm I'm actually quite hyped for this. I wasn't massive on the film, but yeah, we'll see how it's, this goes. It's Zack Snyder was the film, wasn't it? He? he directed it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't do very well, so maybe on TV. This might be a bigger thing, but we shall see. Um, the only thing I'm worried about is whether it requires. Apparently, it's supposed. To, it's not supposed to be like a direct sequel. It apparently just sort of takes ideas from the original. So hopefully, it won't be one that you need to have like read all the source material for in order to go into. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's what the DC <laughs> comparisons came from. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. The fact that you have to do a lot of external reading just to get the gist of it. Yeah, who is that? What's going on? Huh? <laughs> but hopefully it's a bit richer than that. Hmm. Um, but yeah, excited for that. Something I'm possibly more excited for is... I've banged on about this before. It's the What We Do in the Shadows TV adaptation. Yes, yeah, so that's Taika Waititi, is it? Is that, yeah. Is that, um, that right? Yes, and Jermaine Clement from Flight of the Concords. Um, yeah. I think they're, they're directing a couple each. Um, but we now know that BBC Two will be airing it in the UK on Sunday, May nineteenth, which is a, well, just under a week away for you listening now. Okay, so that's at, at yeah, that's really good. Yeah, nine forty-five PM next um, next Sunday. Yeah, I I will be tuning into that for sure. Mm. Sorry to skim through film and TV news <laughs> this week. We're Bit of a bit of a deadline this week. Yeah, the only thing I was so is that everything you wanted to mention? Yeah. Yeah, no, the only thing I was gonna mention for film and TV was obviously that big list of Disney films. Uh but specifically the fact that all four Avatar sequels have release dates now and that's just hilarious to me that oh, they're still doing it. God. That is something you I'm got... really not looking forward to. <laughs> got twenty twenty one, twenty twenty three, twenty twenty five, twenty twenty seven. Avatar 2, 3, 4, 5. <laughs> By which point, no one will care. <laughs> <laughs> no one cares now. <laughs> I did I did see a meme where it was just like, um, everyone was sort of rushing to make sure Avengers did better than Avatar at the box office, and then it's just got like Disney owning both, and it's like an evil face, just kind of like smiling. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's pretty funny. Looking back, like, was it just because it was like, using that innovative 3D tech basically yeah because I cannot remember why there was so much hype around Avatar um I mean James Cameron's done some good stuff he did Titanic yeah don't get me wrong he had some good films I feel like he had a lot of brand name um yeah yeah, it wasn't particularly big stars or anything was it no oh well it it just happened have to see when Avatar 2 3 4 and 5 release hmm God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> so this week I decided not to do much of a deep dive into one story. There was quite a lot of headlines, so I'm gonna be doing stuff in that I'm gonna call Phil's Gaming Bites. <laughs> so it's basically like the headlines of the week section that I usually use 
do to end the gaming news. But there's quite a lot of different stuff here, so if it's interesting, we'll talk about a bit more. If it's not, we'll just skim right past it. Hmm. So anyway, the first one is after last week's discussion, where obviously we were pitching games based on movies, uh, John Wick Hex has just been announced. Oh yeah. Um, based on the obviously the John Wick films. But rather than being an action game or a shooter, it's a strategy game, a bit like <laughs> XCOM. Right. So you kind of like, it's about working your way through a facility and like strategically taking people out rather than just like running through and just shooting everyone. Um, it's got a announced trailer. It looks really interesting actually. It's using kind of more cell shaded graphics. I think I saw if... a thumbnail of this. It looks like, yeah, sort of very unique art style, isn't it? Yeah, so uh, it reminds me a lot of a game called 13 for the PlayStation 2 that had kind of... Car- it's kind of pseudo-cartoony, but not. It kind of very distinct art style. And I think it looks interesting. Um, hmm. good, to, good to see that they've actually sat down and thought what a good game for John Wick would be rather than just be like, it should just be a shooter. Let's yeah. just have him... Re- redo the set pieces from the movies yeah oh, I'd um, be interested so, in playing that you've seen the first two yeah, movies? yeah I've seen the first movie and I did enjoy it I haven't seen yeah. the second one yet yeah it's pretty good and then the third one what's the subtitle for the third one? Uh, oh, Parabellum it's... isn't it? Parabellum yeah yeah no I keep on thinking it's Pandemonium <laughs> 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 no that's not right <laughs> Paris- Penicillin <laughs> Paracetamol. Paris, Paris Hilton. Paris Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> um, so next, you've got news. This is a uh, news about Gearbox. So they are the makers of the Borderlands series of games, but they're also oh, yeah. responsible for Aliens, Colonial Marines. Oh dear. Yeah. And they are currently well. In particular, one of their former staffers is in a bit of a feud with them at the moment because he did the voice for a character called Claptrap in the Borderlands series up until now. I'm aware of this guy, yeah. With the recently announced um, Borderlands 3, because mm. for the first few games he did it for free on top of like his regular role in the company. Right. He just kind of provided the voice. Uh, for this game, he asked to be paid for his voice work. Yeah. And was removed <coughs> as the voice. Oh, really? So, yeah, that's... I mean, he'd left the company a while ago. <laughs> hmm. And the thing is, Randy Pitchford, who's CEO of uh, of Gearbox, who's been responsible for a lot of controversial things in the past, hmm. this being the most recent, uh, was speaking publicly about how they'd offered him twice the going... Uh, union rate for voice actors and stuff like that and just basically writing David Eddings who is the voice actor slash he used to do other roles off as being just bitter and like it all being like wrong and false yeah so David Eddings took to Twitter and was like actually you didn't pay me at all and is going quite public and actually the latest allegation against Randy Pitchford is that he actually assaulted David Eddings when he worked at Gearbox. Really? Yeah, so that is not um amazing. <laughs> no, that's not very pleasant. Yeah, so Gearbox say they're looking into it. Um uh, but Gearbox they've been in trouble before for a lot of things. They got obviously they got sued for false advertising for Aliens Colonial Marines. <laughs> um and Pitchford himself has a uh, a lawsuit against him at the moment from former Gearbox lawyer uh, Wade Callender. So this is reported by GamesIndustry.biz. The suit accuses Pitchford of contract violations, breach of fiduciary duty and fraud, including giving himself a $12 million executive bonus. Brilliant. Um, Which uh, Eddings, the voice actor, makes allusions to in his tweets. Yeah. Basically, like you couldn't pay me, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, you could mad. pay yourself like a massive bonus. So I think this, yeah, obviously, obvious in cases like this, I think it's always best practice to obviously believe 
victims and things like that and uh, and hopefully Gearbox will do a full investigation internally but for god's sake pay your voice actors <laughs> yeah and don't no, that's outrageous. assault people yeah <laughs> these aren't difficult lessons really no don't assault people is pretty obvious you think anyway so moving on to more developers being caught out or getting controversial in the news Never Realm Studios, so behind Mortal Kombat games, oh yeah, is the latest company to face allegations of 100 hour weeks and crunch. Brilliant. Um, which is a great shame. And actually, um, just to quote directly from the article I read on this, uh, current employees at the developer spoke of 100 hour weeks and it's a self-sustaining crunch cycle that burns through new talent as well as a toxic bro-centric work environment that is unwelcoming to women. Oh, and that's no, disappoint really? that's disappointing on a few fronts because obviously a 100 hour week self-sustaining crunch is awful and a lot of developers being called out for it can only be a good thing for the future of the industry. Yeah. But that kind of that second half the bro-centric work environment I think that's an absolute shame because the fighting game community already has a bit of a reputation of yeah. being well, to be honest, when you think of a fighting game player, you usually think of a of a man and yeah, a triangular shaped great... man launching himself in the air. Yeah, <laughs> I'm thinking no, the players, not the characters. Oh right, yeah, and that, <laughs> <laughs> like the people who go to the tournaments, like the the high level players. Yeah, and I think getting more people, I think getting more people and a more like wider range of people into fighting games and into the communities would be a really good thing in the long term. Yeah, no, I agree. But like knowing that even at the studios that create the fighting games, there's this kind of bro centric environment is very disappointing. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Now moving on to news that is less contentious, I think. Um, there's been a new trailer for the Final Fantasy VII remake after I think it's about four years of nothing <laughs> uh, so it's a bit of a weird it looks very good it's a very good looking trailer if you've, have you seen it? no so it's like it looks very good and but it's just a bit strange because there's a few things about this because the original Final Fantasy 7 was a turn based RPG yeah so you know it's just one person standing like two people facing each other one person goes up slaps yeah. steps backwards the other person goes up slaps yeah and this standard battle system yeah. yeah yeah this this new one though has been turned into an action RPG so it's like mm. uh, so obviously that that'll make the the combat like well it's action it's not turn based anymore mm. but for a remake that seems like a weird thing to change yeah like so it's basically it's telling the same story obviously but changing the gameplay completely yeah um and as when it was originally announced a few years ago it's still being broken up into multiple releases which also seems a bit nuts to me what are they different but at the like, end of the you have to pay for each one do you yeah so the game's being split up into multiple releases it'll be like Classic. chapters or something and you'll have to pay for each one right uh the tr trailer says more information in june so I'm wondering if that means we'll hear more at E3. Hmm. Um, but yeah, because I didn't grow up the Final Fantasy VII game, I just I don't really have much investment in this. But this seems like a very st strange way to do it. Yeah. Like, granted, like building it again from the ground up, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You see these videos on YouTube of people remaking Zelda levels and Mario levels and other gaming levels in like Unreal Engine with super high caliber graphics hmm. and a lot of people in the comments are always like oh why don't Nintendo do this or etc cetera, etc cetera. like I'd love this but actually you, you don't just the, want a remake the, do you yeah but changing the actual genre of the game seems a bit strange <laughs> to me yeah but also yeah I think like it's important to like reinterpret things as otherwise you just get shot for shot remakes which are a bit pointless really yeah no it's like definitely probably it's like it'll be interesting to see how this is received because it could it's the first remake I think that's actually doing this kind of dynamic change hmm. and if it was well received I'd be interested to see other old games reimagined yeah. in, in new genres yeah 
um, and like mixed up a bit. But yeah, it's a bit odd to me. Like you say, it would have wouldn't well it wouldn't be taking this long to come out if it was just like a up- updated look of the old game. So yeah, we'll have to see when we hear more news about it next month. Yeah. Uh, so next, uh, U.S. Senator is actually introducing legislation to ban loot boxes. Yes, I did so see this something one, about this actually. Yeah. Yeah. So this one I didn't want to spend too much on because we've spoken about loot boxes on multiple episodes in the past. Hmm. Um, but I do want to say this is kind of what we always said though when we did talk about it is that if they don't self-regulate, they're going to get regulated f- instead. Yeah. And when laws and things come into effect, sometimes they can, you know, be squashing a fly with a mallet <laughs> and they can just overreach and they can have un unintended consequences for the rest of the industry. Um but you know, if it puts something in place that just stops these kind of bad practices once and for all, then Yeah. You know, there's gonna be it's ripples. Just games for other should countries. be just fun rather than like have people like paying for to be better at a game, especially if you're playing online and stuff like that, I think. Well, that's the thing, and a lot of a lot of the money for loot boxes comes from a very small number of people, so it's it's that very dirty feeling that they're probably getting a lot of it from people who do suffer from addiction issues or gambling issues. Yeah. Who get that kind of who get addicted to kind of getting that yeah satisfaction of opening up the boxes and whatever. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's. I think not like, much to sell in their part. Maybe except, time. with the exception of like um, when you can get like extra appearances and stuff like that for paying and stuff oh, yeah, like cos- that. Cos- cosmetics, cosmetics but yeah. But then I think it's kind of all, also the kind of the chance element with it because, like, typically, although a few games have changed this recently, you don't know the chances of getting certain stuff, the probabilities. Yeah. Um. But if you want a cosmetics, you could just do it as a DLC, like pay a pound and yeah. get this costume, rather than paying a pound for the chance of getting it. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Because unlike obvious, unlike say trading cards, which we were actually talking about before we started recording. Yeah. Like you can swap those. You could sell it on eBay. And also, there's just you know the chances are always written on the back yeah this because it's digital it's kind of you're stuck with it yeah um in a lot of cases so i feel like um no. I, the thumbnail i saw for that article was still using the um picture from star wars battlefront which i think is so like unfairly overused at this point that, that's that's ea's problem really they've yeah. become well, I mean, the poster they'd... child for loot boxes which is weird because like that game I mean, yeah, it's was, it was a slightly rocky start, but they like where the where the game is now. I feel like they've really left it to their creative teams, and they're adding like new game modes and new content and new planets and new appearances and new characters and stuff for like as free upgrades every couple of months or so. Yeah, and it makes me feel bad for the developer really hmm. because like EA has a reputation of buying studios, getting them to make games that aren't in their wheelhouse. The games do poorly, and then they shut those studios. It's happened hmm. with a ton over the past like twenty years, yeah. um, and this feels like it might happen again if there's a negative impact from the poor performance of Battlefront Two. They won't take the blame on themselves; they'll blame the studio, who seem to be trying their best to mitigate. Yeah, because they probably this is probably a case again, like we've spoken before, where like we were talking about the Sonic trailer last week where there were people like the feet on the ground were like let's not do this yeah but some executive higher up was like no we have to yeah. this is what we're doing we've done a um, do it. we've done like a uh, what do you call it like a community discussion or something and they think it would be best like this so that we're doing it basically yeah yeah um so it's it's yeah it's a shame about Star Wars Battlefront 2 um I did find it ironic this is slightly going off topic um about the announce of Jedi Fallen Order when EA were like guaranteeing no loot boxes. No box. yeah. <laughs> and it's like you literally created a problem to solve yourself. Yeah. Like this is patting yourself on the back for something that you did. Yeah. <laughs> it's just uh it was kind of funny but at the same time kind of 
exasperating. Yeah. Uh, so did you? Because I think I've mentioned it before, but Two Point Hospital. I've told you about this game, right? A hospital sim. Yes, you have. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so Sega have just acquired Two Point Studios, the developer behind it. Mm -hmm. So Sega published Two Point Hospital anyway, um, and that could be quite interesting. Like, means that they'll have a bit more security, and they've got a guaranteed publisher for their games. Yeah. So I'd be interested to see. I'm not sure what they'd make next, because it's made of old Bullfrog developers. So Bullfrog was a Bullfrog, funnily enough, was bought up by EA and then run into the ground and then shut down. Brilliant. <laughs> um, and they made Theme Hospital. They made a game called Theme Park and I think a few others. Hmm. But I don't particularly want Two Point Studios to make a Theme Park game because there's already Planet Coaster, which we reported on last week, which does that very well. Yeah, sounds good. So I'd, I'd rather them do something else. You know... <laughs> Not have everyone go to the theme park, make a theme park one. <laughs> yeah. And we've got City Skylines, which I'm going to talk about in a second, which is like a good city sim. So there's going to be other good ideas for like making simulator games, and I hope Two Point finds them, because yeah. Two Point Hospital is really good. Yeah. Um, city Skylines, on the other hand, is getting university campuses in a new DLC. Oh, yeah. So that's actually pretty pretty neat. It's not like their natural disasters DLC they did like a few years ago Jesus. for it. Oh, the natural disasters one is kind of fun. Oh, really? Like there is a certain amount of evil satisfaction. The same as like on The Sims doing terrible stuff, <laughs> but like building a beautiful city and then just being like meteor strike. Is it a bit intense? <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Meteor strike's okay, I guess, as long as it's not just like devastating tsunami. Oh, you can do that as well. Oh, jeez, is that a bit insensitive? <laughs> A, a little bit but the thing is you're on such a it sounds really bad you're on such a macroscopic level yeah but it just seems like you're wrecking buildings yeah I suppose <laughs> in your virtual world yeah um and also it gets turn. it's something you can turn on as like a random event thing right so it happens so once you, in a while if you, yeah yeah if you want it as like a random like as an extra challenge when you're like doing your building your city you can have it so it's like random or I just loaded up one of my cities that was already built and thriving and just destroyed it and just didn't save. Amazing. So it's still there. <laughs> so there's just, I don't know, there's a weird satisfaction with that. But the university campus is going to have, like, university buildings. And I think that could add, like, some quite interesting stuff. Um, but obviously it's not going to be quite as big a hit as some of their other DLCs. Yeah. Fallout 76, your favourite game. Mm-hmm. Uh... <laughs> has introduced these like it's because there's selling between players and this is like a little like vending machine thing you can set up and so you can put your stuff in it so people can buy it if you're not on the game okay um but as part of bethesda trying to main like trying to regulate the game's in-game economy there's a 10 percent tax on it right and the players are not happy <laughs> because they're, they're like what taxes yeah yeah, in the, um, the post-apocalypse post world. <laughs> and some players are rightly pointing out that you're not going to regulate their in-game economy that way. Because some MMOs do have the problem of like hyperinflation. Because yeah. obviously killing enemies will always drop loot. Yes. So that's adding more and more money into the economy. Yeah. Um, But players are just responding with, that won't do anything. People will just make their stuff 10% more expensive <laughs> to cover it. Yeah. And therefore, it's not going to do anything. Yeah. So I thought it was quite funny that the first uh, Fallout seventy six just continues just to stumble around. <laughs> and well, second to last for gaming news, uh, this one is just one quite a good idea potentially. Uh, Microsoft has filed a patent for a controller accessory which has a Braille input and output. Oh, that's nice. So, yeah, Microsoft have been doing pretty well. We reported last year that they'd made a special controller for people in fact, with accessibility issues. Yes, I remember that, yeah. Um, and this um, could be like an extra cool thing on top. Yeah, I think that's a really sweet if idea. It leads to something. It would have a way of reading, get, getting like in-game text to like come up as Braille on the controller Yeah. and have an input as well for you to 
do it back and I think that's really cool yeah how does that work no idea <laughs> <laughs> magic let's just it's, say magic yeah I was going to say um, if you want you could look up the details of the patent and possibly see how it's designed but I'm not sure how patents work or if you have to wait until it's registered before you can actually see it right yeah finally and this leads into our discussion today the Japanese ambassador sees Pikachu as his son <laughs> uh, which I've really not got anything to say yeah. apart from it's adorable and the weirdest f- headline I've read this week <laughs> oh that's really he just, sweet he tweeted a picture of Pikachu um, recently because obviously the, the movie came out hmm. saying like I always saw Pikachu as my son I've heard like enjoy this and um, and I'm gonna go enjoy Detective Pikachu now thank oh. you <laughs> and it's just oh yeah well a swell endorsement for that movie <laughs> So, now we get on to the movie discussion this week, which is Detective Pikachu, which is a weird a, a, a weird title for a movie that <laughs> when we started this podcast four years ago, I did not think would be a movie. <laughs> but I'm so glad uh, it is. <laughs> I'm so glad it is. Uh, so we're going to do a, a little bit of non-spoilers first, uh, then we'll tell you in advance when we get into spoilers. And then just talk about kind of how, as a video game movie, this kind of affects the situation and kind of the stereotype of there are no good video game movies. Yeah. So, first of all, what did you think, Nick? I thought it was pretty good. So did I. (laughs) I think... um... It was... It was better than it had any right to be. Exactly, yeah. I think this was... uh, It's actually more nostalgic than you might think because it's I mean you've seen from the trailers and stuff it's predominantly more sort of the old school gen 1 bit of gen 2 Pokemon isn't it yeah and there are certain bits and actually certain bits in like the soundtrack and the presentation yeah that harks back to not just the games but the TV like the the anime yeah yeah that's true and um and I think that's all very much on purpose. Yeah, I think this. Yeah, this is way more sort of. Uh, I, f- I was t- I was saying this the other day. Like the fact that it's sort of Ryan Reynolds as well, who's kind of like in that, he's right in that sort of like late teens market and stuff as well. I feel like they could have mm. possibly pushed this up to a twelve certificate, maybe, and made it a little bit more edgy. <laughs> See, I found like. Reynolds obviously playing Detective Pikachu. I found that some of his lines were already a bit like hmm. pushing it. Yeah, I felt um, I felt like the structure itself was maybe a little bit simplistic. Oh yeah, like the plot is pretty standard, and a lot of the twists you can see coming a mile away. Yeah, this isn't um, this isn't but, like a noir detective movie either. I mean, not that I was ever expecting that, but like. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I feel like they could have maybe pushed... Because I think even... I haven't played the game, but like I've seen the trailers and stuff like that. I think may, maybe even the game is a little bit more mature than this, potentially. I, I think they, from what I've heard, the game... Like, the actual gameplay itself hmm. is very, very simplistic in the game. Right, okay. And, like, yeah, I think it's like, like this is this is about on par from what I've heard the game is like. Right, okay. well, actually, apparently that's... So if you've played the Detective Pikachu game as well, apparently this very much follows a, a very similar plot, um, which I mm. guess which I guess is quite handy because then the writers of this film didn't have to go in without any guidance whatsoever about how to make a video game movie because they had an existing plot to go on that already kind of lended itself to a to a three act structure. True. Do you think? The game and the film were green lit at the same time, or do you think the game had started development and they realised it'd be a good idea for a film, or th- do you think the film was conceived first? I think they because um the the game only came out a year or two ago, right? Last year, last, last year. year, I think. So I, f- I feel like they might have even been conceived at the same time. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised yeah. just because it's so out of left field. Yeah, like so out of nowhere. Yeah. Um. I say good things about this film, obviously, apart from obviously a lot of the nostalgia bits that made me go like, oh, I remember that. Yeah. Um, I was telling Nick before we started recording, 
Uh, it came with my my viewing came with free Pokemon trading cards, Ugh. which I haven't had since I was seven. Yeah, so jealous. Um, I got a Magic Carp and a Detective Pikachu, and I mean they're just going to sit in a drawer because I don't <laughs> play Pokemon. Yeah, but still, it's just kind of that. Even that is adding to that like nostalgic experience. Yeah, the or, cinema or I was in was basically. I don't think there was any kids. What I mean, it was quite late. It was a half seven, but it was very busy. Um, hmm. And they were mostly sort of around my age, I'd say, because yeah, I think, I think they actually could have leaned a bit more into. I think they could have made enough of an audience themselves just off nostalgic audience rather than trying to target a family audience. I'm not sure, but we'll see how the box office. I don't know. My do. my view was actually pretty uh, evenly split between parents and kids and people about my age watching it. Yeah. And like adults, yeah. um, mine was again about half seven, so actually it was quite late for some of those kids, I reckon. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe, but, um, that's me being very like. I no, mean, I know, I know what you mean. They can't possibly um, make a, a family film edgier. I know I'm being ridiculous, but like, I feel like I'd at least quite like to see a twelve rated cut of that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know because there's some very like. Um, glossy glossy actions glossy violent scenes basically um involving a, mm. a, a a very specific pokemon who i was gleeful to see basically but i feel like some of the action scenes involving that pokemon could have could have been a little bit harder edged <laughs> you know a I little mean? bit yeah do you know, the, do you know the specific yeah. pokemon i'm talking about yes we'll go yeah. when we'll talk about that more in spoilers i think yeah um but yeah, I think but yeah, it's... everything about the film's pretty good. I think everyone everyone was chuckling the whole way through because Ryan Reynolds is just doing he's just turned up to eleven on Ryan Reynoldsness because he's just quipping and and making reference to plot points the whole movie basically, which is very. I'm not convinced they. I'm not convinced they wrote any lines for Detective Pikachu. They just let him just riff. Yeah, <laughs> some of the, some of the lines are just so out there. Yeah, like, I'm not. I'm like. This is clearly just him having a great time in a recording booth. Yeah, in the in uh, as long as it roughly fit the shot scene. Yeah, <laughs> and that's fine. It is basically him kind of doing Deadpool, but it's it's fun. It's nice that that you can get a, a PG version of Deadpool now. It's great. <laughs> hmm. I say that was quite. It's quite good. It's quite a diverse cast as well, which I thought was really really good. Yeah, that was fun. Um, yeah, and I think they all. They all do pretty well considering a lot of that's probably CG and them interacting with like green screens or like yeah tennis balls on sticks or whatever I mean I say that a lot um, of the behind the scenes do show a lot of um, practical sets so there's a bit where without giving too much away where like there's some movement in the the ground beneath them kind of thing and I, I, they I shot a lot of that on, on real sets with obviously like the background and stuff were green screen but like what they're actually interacting with looks very real and heavy um, okay, that's that's good. Yeah, it doesn't just look like rubber people kind of springing around in a all CGI world. It's, and the the Pokemon characters themselves, I thought, what I mean, you've seen them all in the trailers, so it's not really a spoiler. But like, I feel they feel animated enough, and they've got a very specific sort of cartoony style to them that I really sort of I really bought the world basically. Yeah, and like they. they... They didn't look so real, it looked weird. Yes. But they didn't look fake. Sonic! <coughs> yeah, no, it's like, after watching that movie, the Sonic trailer makes even less sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> because, oh, like, there is a, some Pokemon that just, like, came across so well. Yeah, I think another interesting reason it works so well is because it's not, it's not like modern-day San Francisco or Los Angeles or anything. It's just kind of... It's a, it's a, it's a made-up world with... There's little allusions to other place names that you might recognise from the Pokemon universe as well. It's it's a very interesting, unique world, and yeah, it's very easy to buy it. There's quite a bit of heavy exposition dumps about the world towards the beginning. Yes, but, but <laughs> if anything, that's what makes it work as a standalone film. I think you could watch this quite mm -hmm. easily without just being nostalgic. I feel like you've got enough exposition to kind of get you through it. See, I'm I'm a bit torn. So I feel there's enough exposition that you could, mm. but I'd say that a lot of the charm would be lost if you didn't know anything about Pokemon beforehand. Yeah, I think a I'd bit. I'd say of this the charm. is very much for the fans. 
I feel and that's like kind of what made it good. That's fair, but I feel like I feel like it's if if I was to recommend this to people, I'd say like go and watch it because it's funny anyway. I don't think you absolutely mm. need to because if, if without the nostalgia, I th- I still think it would work as like a an okay family film with a good cast. Yeah, without the nostalgia, yeah, it's kind of like a fam. It's a family detective movie with a cute mascot. Yeah. So um, just before we go into spoilers, what would you? How much of a thumbs up would you give this? Oh, not this rating system. <laughs> yeah, please. Because <laughs> um, it's between zero and ninety degree thumbs up, isn't uh, it? Yes, that's right. Um, like. 75 degrees of a thumbs up I'd say yeah. I've just realised that's not a correct system either because it should be between minus 90 and 90 really shouldn't it yeah because yeah <laughs> I might I might I might skip that rating system <laughs> out of 10 out of 10 like a normal person <laughs> I'm fi- I'm finally <laughs> calling an end to my thumbs up and down rating system um, out of 10 I would give this a 6.5 I would say fair fair so actually funnily enough you saying that and me saying what I've said I'd give it a 7 yeah yeah although um, yeah I think it just like it knows what it wants to be and it does it well yeah it doesn't do it amazing but it does it well yeah and I think um, that's yeah yeah no I, I think it's definitely worth a watch um just uh, so we'll move on to spoilers from now. We'll put that time code in the description as well. Um, mm-hmm. The bit I was referring to was um, the seemingly the main antagonist of the movie, New Two, mm. which I thought well, was that a... he was in the trailers. So yeah, it's not Matt, which but it's not. It's, it's not like from the trailers you could only assume he's in it for one scene, which I thought he was. Um, yeah, I thought it was going to be a cameo. Yeah, uh, but no, he's actually quite an integral part of the plot. Um, not not a villain. This is technically a sequel to Pokemon the first movie, right? Yeah, I thought that. I thought that was crazy. Because um, they make reference to how he escaped from Kanto or whatever Kanto, many, many, yeah. year, many years ago. <laughs> and I said, oh, this is a sequel. It's a little, um, it's a one line thing, but you could take this as a sequel to the first movie because Mewtwo was, was um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He kind of came came back as like a good guy at the end of that movie after realising mm. what he is kind of thing and then in this movie he's he's still good at heart basically he's still the most powerful Pokemon in the world though and he's again people make use of his powers to for evil basically um, I wanted that breakout scene to be a bit more hard edged is, is what I was referring to earlier what are you talking about the opening scene yeah because I always felt like the first movie was, was quite violent the the opening to that I was going to say there's bits about yeah that first animated movie there are bits that get very hard edged aren't there yeah like Mewtwo could probably blow someone's head up if he wanted why didn't we see any of that (laughs) (laughs) I think that's the thing with live action though is that all of a sudden like between like an animation completely animated to like live action yeah that all of a sudden goes from being like a cartoon to traumatic for a child (laughs) I kind of wanted to see it though Considering the audience that I saw it with, we we're all sort of older, and I, I don't know, I would have quite liked to see Mewtwo blow some people's <laughs> heads up, but like that would have never happened. So that's not really a criticism. <laughs> a, a scene at the beginning where like Mewtwo's holding up someone by like the neck, yeah, <laughs> like strangling them. Someone else runs over to help, and he just flicks him away with his tail. Yeah. <laughs> I'd have loved to see that, um, but mm-hmm. no, he's still a really cool part of the plot, and I like the way they used him. I. I thought Bill Nye was a bit miscast, and I never usually say that. See, I I liked him. It was kind of, it was it was really just a trip. Just sat there listening to Bill Nye use Pokemon words. Yeah, uh, so, so him he takes over Mewtwo towards the end of the film, and he's it's very kind of just kind of camp shouty villain, um, which I guess is quite fun. Yeah. But like I don't know, I think I feel like. He wasn't the perfect cast for that. I liked um, his son's character with the sunglasses, who's revealed to be Ditto. I thought that was quite a good. That was quite a good twist. Yeah, and that no, was genu- genuinely quite of... unnerving as well when he turns into the love interest. 
Yes. <laughs> no, I thought that was nice, subtly uh, preempted yeah. when you see the ditto at the beginning. Yes. Yeah, I didn't expect them um, to take that route. That's probably one of the only twists that uh, I didn't see coming. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the other. I whilst I kind of appreciated the kind of the mirror between like the father son father son thing with the heroes and the villains. Yeah. Um, it becomes very obvious very early how how the film's going to end with regards to him being able to talk to Pikachu. Yeah. Um, like it didn't take me very long to guess. No, exactly. I, I and I thought actually they were quite reserved on the sort of final fight scene. I, like, you know, you know, I'm always a bit disappointed. I always because I'm a bit tired of big battle sequences at the end of movies. Apart from like, Avengers did it in a quite a creative way, but um, this was just kind of like generic people just throwing each other about in the sky. But at least it doesn't. It it didn't last too long, if you know what I mean. Yeah. No, I actually. F- because there's the equivalent. As much as it wasn't. It's the equivalent of a big blue light in the sky as well. Is that they were kind of turning people into their, into putting people's Pokemon. souls into their Pokemon, um, as a big finale kind of thing. And it, it did just feel like a bit of a, a standard big finale. <laughs> yeah, like I didn't really understand the plan. No, I'm going to be quite honest. Yeah, <laughs> like I understood him probably going into Mewtwo so he can extend his own life mm. and you know wanting to get some mobility back and all that mm. but he was just like I'm going to do it to everyone I was like wait what? Yeah why? Why? Because <laughs> <laughs> he's mad because he's just a bit generic, yeah. generically mad it's it's generic villain plot really yeah. but yeah. and that's the thing a lot of this plot was kind of a very simple yeah. story but I guess it's a kids very, movie isn't it so yeah very simple themes. I need to keep reminding was... myself of that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was kind of done well at the same time. Yeah, like, no, absolutely. It was basic but done well, which I think is something that video game movies in general need to learn. Yeah. Is that it doesn't need to be super complicated and it doesn't need to follow the plot of the games. Although this one did, but not the main series Pokemon games. So yes. It kind of gets away with it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I um, liked how they they did a very creative way of getting around the fact that um, the, the, uh, the plot lend itself to... I'm not sure if this is the to the praise of the game or praise of the movie, but the fact that they kind of overcame the resistance to keeping it the same sort of structure as the game. Because it's explained very early on that like the whole battling and training and stuff like that is kind of an archaic thing. Hmm. And this is like a modern, so it's it's kind of almost follows the chronology of the chronology of like if you played Pokemon Yellow or, or um, Red or Blue as a kid, this is kind of this is about the same time scale after that I'd say where you no longer have to like battle Pokemon and stuff like that, and it's kind of like an illegal underground thing if you do. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was it was an interesting idea because it implies that the rest of the world still does that. Yeah, it's just this this city's trying to be different mm. and like progressive. Yeah. in that I feel like it worked but better. Obviously, still do it underground. Yeah, and I feel like it worked better as a film um, by not just because like I've always like I've always like been pretty um, obsessed with the idea of a live action Pokemon movie. I was like, how are they going to make this work? But they kind of they don't just do. Hey, it's Ash Ketchum, and he's got to be the very best, and <laughs> this, that, yeah. and the other. It's just it's it moves on like it feels much more modern than that, and I think it really works as a it works as a film. There's certain things that just from the games, from the main series titles, that would just not translate. Yeah, like a live action character walking along and someone else being like, "We've made eye contact, therefore we must battle." Yeah, <laughs> would have just been ridiculous. Yeah. Um, um, and I did really appreciate in the underground battle the fact there's like two MCs calling out the attacks. Yes, <laughs> I thought that was very clever. Yeah, I th- yeah, I thought like the way because they had to have like a little inclusion of the original games, I suppose, and they had to have like a little Pokemon battle in it, like a traditional Pokemon battle in it. And I, I think the mm. way they worked that into the plot was was quite interesting and and creative. Yeah, yeah. No, I think. And I like actually the the first scene where you're introduced to the main character is a scene about catching a Pokemon. Yes. Because it wouldn't have fit in the rest of the film, but that's what everyone's always wanted to see is a live action version of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the Pokeballs and everything as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, I thought I thought it was I thought it was really good. I'd definitely be down for watching more in this in this franchise. Yeah, so what I just wanted to do very briefly before we before we close the episode is if there was one lesson, for good or for bad, that you could take from this film to give to every other studio that wants to make a video game movie, what would it be? Um start with a story. <laughs> don't don't just start with the concept <laughs> yeah I think it's I think my one is stop worrying so much about making it so like explaining it to people who don't know what they're saying yeah because there's so many video game films Sonic kind of seems like it's going to be one yeah that for some reason is concerned that you won't know who Sonic is <laughs> And therefore you need an origin story. Yeah. Which is completely different. Yeah. And the Mario Bros. movie was completely different to the games. Yeah. There are enough people in the population now that play games on a regular basis. Yeah. That I think we... And Assassin's Creed, that movie is like 60% origin. Yeah. And like the facility. Yeah. What pe- people want are those high points from the games... And they don't want to, like, they, they'll come to see it because they know the games and they enjoy the games. Obviously, something like this has the benefit that it can appeal to people who don't know the games. But, like, just don't try, don't, don't feel that the source material you're working with is too silly or whatever. Yeah. Just lean into it because that's why people play the games. Yeah, exactly. Or if you're going to, I mean, you, you don't have to necessarily use the source material either. You can just kind of. Uh, this one I think did something very clever in terms of it it put the source material chronologically in this timeline but just not they didn't make it like the forefront of the movie I think they started with a script and they started with a story and they they just made it work Pokemon has the benefit of all of the games are about different people yeah so there's no expectation that it'll be Ash or Red or whatever yeah and that really plays in the benefit because all that actually the Pokemon provides for this movie is the world in which it takes place. Yeah, basically. The the core details could have been whatever they wanted. Yeah. And that's not going to work for all games, but it is a good thing to take forward if you are working with a game series that could be similar. Best video game like for, movie of all time, is it? By, um, by default? Assuming that... <laughs> kind of by default, uh, just because we can't... Uh, can't say it's Wreck-It Ralph. No. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, Pika Pika. Uh, and so that just about wraps up this episode. Sorry it's been a little bit shorter than usual. It's a busy, busy weekend for both of us. Is it bank holiday? I never know. No, it's not. not this anymore. is one of the only weekends in May that isn't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, busy, busy weekend for both of us. Um, but yeah, I'm glad we got to speak about Detective Pikachu. Um, thank you very much for joining us as always. You can follow us on Twitter at Synopt Podcast. Find us on iTunes. Find us on SoundCloud. We are still on YouTube, just about. Um, I'm at Mick Nortimer on Twitter. I'm at Haddo Inc. Uh, anything you want to plug? Um, uh, join us on the Haddo Inc. YouTube channel uh, me and Vicky are playing through A Hat in Time still very good series, the DLC is just released and I, if I have time today I'll buy it and play it but I'm not sure if I will um, next week is our 50th episode dun, 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 dun. Uh, so Brad and Millie will be back to guest again that's on um, the, it won't be any news it's a marvellous be... MCU quiz so you can play along if you'd like next week I will be hosting for the first time it's exciting it's a big milestone for our 50th yeah it's a really good episode I hope, um, a bit lengthier than this one but uh, yeah I think I think, I think you're going to really love that one but until then I've been Phil and I've been Nick thank you very much for listening see you next week bye bye